Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Educational Series. I'm Danny Bobro, President of AIM Dental Marketing. Happy to welcome an unusually large number of new subscribers to our series today. And I just want to take a quick look here and make sure that everybody is seeing the screen. And we are indeed broadcasting. Excellent. It is my pleasure to welcome as today's very special guest, Dr. Peter Evans. Dr. Evans earned his Bachelor of Science degree from East Carolina University and then worked in cancer research for the National Institutes of Health until he returned to graduate school and received his Master of Science degree in Microbiology and Immunology from the Medical College of Virginia, studying the chronic inflammatory process under Dr. Ron Ruddy and was just four months from completing his research for his PhD when his passions led him to enter dental school. He has served as adjunct faculty at Virginia Commonwealth University, teaching undergraduate bacteriology, and in 1982, received his DDS from the Medical College in Virginia. Dr. Evans has completed over 2,000 hours of advanced continuing education. He is a recipient of the prestigious mastership from the Academy of General Dentistry. He is a practitioner, author, speaker, and internationally renowned dental coach and founding member of the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health, which is how we met, and an active member of numerous dental organizations. Dr. Evans' research and energy result in innovative solutions drawn from interdisciplinary fields from genetics, biology, medicine, psychology, biomechanics, bioenergetics, and physics to the emerging and evolving discipline of biocompatible dental care. He is a leading expert on the topic of biocompatible dentistry and its effect on total body health, practice performance, and staff motivation, and is why we're so excited to have him join us today. As creator of biocompatible dentistry for whole body health and the natural path to dental profits, Evans has helped dental offices across the country and abroad improve efficiency, patient care, productivity, and prosperity. As usual, today's event will run for 90 minutes. I invite you at any time to submit your questions using the question button on your screen. We will do our best to get to all your questions following Dr. Evans' presentation. If we are unable to do that, Dr. Evans has graciously offered to follow up with you personally. I am joined today by my life and business partner, Virginia Norton, who will field your questions during the presentation. Now, because today's presentation will be recorded and shared, we want you to just sit back, relax, and enjoy Peter's talk. And now, let's hear from Peter Evans on the leading edge topic of biocompatible dentistry. Hello, Peter. Danny, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure uh, to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me go ahead and get started. Um, I can. Uh, I'll have a question, a couple of questions uh, for you, Danny, uh, during the uh, during the conversation. So. Uh, uh, you can kind of uh, help out and uh, be speaking directly to people on the call today. So uh, just to give you uh, some of that background again, for the past many, many years I've studied with uh, naturopaths and oncologists and doctors of osteopathy and biologists and, and a bunch of dentists. Um, so the things that we've learned and that I've learned uh, in the past 20 years didn't come all from dental school. Um, part of the things came from all these other disciplines that I have uh, engaged in, and uh, my friends and associates have have guided me and said, "This is what this is what dentistry means to me from uh, an oncologist or from an acupuncturist." So, uh, I've taken that and, and developed the, all the all the procedures and the protocols in, of, of biocompatibledentist.com based on this past 20 years. So, to make sure that uh, you're in the right place to, to hear all of this information. I wanted to make sure that if you are going to service the 30% of your patients who are buying into their health right now, then you're in the right place. If you want to have a, a profitable business model with uh, the most personal and professional satisfaction, then dentistry for whole body health uh, is, is for you and you're in the right place. And also if you want to see your case average and your case acceptance increase, by offering your patients dentistry for whole body health, then you're in the right place also. So there's several takeaways I want to uh, get today with you. And uh, the first takeaway is I want to 
solve your new patient problem. And I'm going to do that in two different ways. So that's the first thing I want to do. Uh, we're going to do that through the seven diagnostic disciplines to improve your diagnosis and your treatment planning. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on that today, too, to make sure. And the third takeaway I want you to have is how to get your mercury-free office to become a mercury-safe office. What are the procedures and protocols? I'm going to have the one procedure that you absolutely need to do to become mercury safe in your office and how that's going to benefit your patients, your practice, and uh, the planet also. And before we're done, for everyone that's going to stay on the call all the way through, I've got uh, another takeaway. I want to give you uh, a list, because I'm always asked, so what, what materials are you using? What, you know, what biocompatible composites do we have? What, what's the list that you have? I want to get you the list of the BPA-free composite resins, some of which um, uh, composite resins are good, some are not so good. So uh, I'll give you the list uh, there at the end that, that I've got for um, BPA-free composite resins. So that's an excellent offer, Peter, because I get asked that all the time, too. So I think that's a great reason alone to, to, to hang in there. Hey, and, and if you're going to get to this, then, then, then just uh, let me know. But, you know, you mentioned you've talked to these specialists or these practitioners in different fields of healthcare about what dentistry means to them. Have you found any recurring theme or any kind of uh, general assessment? I mean, you know, I think my guess would be that uh, they don't have as much of an appreciation for its potential to help patients achieve health as, 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 as they ought to. But... That's just my guess at this point. Well, when, when, you, when you talk to the masses, if you talk to integrated physicians, if you talk to regular physicians, uh, no, they don't even look at the mouth for periodontal disease, which is one of the seven diagnostic disciplines. They have trouble doing that. But once you talk to integrated physicians and functional physicians and oncologists, the people who are, are in tune understand this and, this, and this is what I've taken away from all of those, uh, uh, Danny, and this is for everybody on the call, is that the mouth is the most powerful place on the body. Now, that's not for a conversation today because that, that's not something I want you to take away. But to answer your question, the theme that I found through all of the people from acupuncture on down is that how powerful the mouth is in the whole body health uh, of the patient. So uh, that's, what get I, it. Yeah, that's what I took away from it. So right. let's go to the first takeaway. In the new patients, and I'm going to touch base on this in a couple of different ways, but Let's just take what the average new patient is, maybe 10, 20 patients a new month, I mean uh, per month. Uh, national average is somewhere between 12 and $1,500 uh, average new patient value in a practice. They come into the practice through hygiene or on the doctor's side. In my practice, they come in through the doctor's side. Uh, and in the old model, uh, the hygienist and the, and the dentist, they were just looking for something to fix all day long. Now. The new model of dentistry is dentistry for whole body health, and my average new patient value is $10,000 plus. Uh, that that kind of crushes the national average there. So the benefit to your practice, the benefit to your patient is going to be pretty obvious by the time we're done today. Now let me just cover financially the levels of care. Uh, Level one, if you're trying to get to, let's just take an average of $70,000 a month, if, if your new patient average is $1,000. And this is kind of like the insurance model of, 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 of practice. Then you're going to need 70 new patients to reach $70,000. And that, that practice is more is less. That's how that relates. Uh, a different level that's just up from that at two or $3,000 per new patient value, you only need 28 new patients. And more is more at that point. So the more new patients, the more you're going to get. Level three, if you're up around $5,000 uh, per new patient value, then you only need 14 patients, and less is more. And the fourth value is the expert value uh, level here is $10,000 per new patient is less is far more. So you'd only need seven new patients to reach $70,000 um, production per new patients. Now, on my new patients, and this is what I want to relate to today, there are three questions I ask every new patient. Now, I want you to write these down, or, or you just, you'll just get a copy of the, uh, of the uh, webinar and record it then. But the three, new, the three questions I ask every new patient are these. I want to know what kind of dentist are you looking for? I want to know in our work together what will your goals be? What do you want to accomplish? 
And my other question is, are you going to keep your mercury fillings? So I cover those, and I pre-frame them. They just don't ask, they, we just don't ask them one, two, three. But let me go through these with you, with the verbal skills, and let you know with new patients how these are asked to the patient and at what time during the new patient exam. So the first question, what kind of dentist are you looking for? This is kind of the very first question I ask out of the, out of the shoot. Uh, my assistant will bring the new patient back. Um, I'm introduced to the new patient, and uh, I'll say, you know, how can I help you? Well, you know, and they'll say, well, you know, it's a time for cleaning, or, uh, or I'm, I'm looking to get the mercury out. If, if they don't tell me exactly, immediately, what they're, what they, why they're in my office, then I ask them, what kind of dentist are you looking for? And they've never been asked that question before in their life, and it takes them back just a bit. And they said, they, they, they kind of feel like, well, aren't you all dentists? Don't you fix teeth? You know, there's two other down the road. There's uh, more in town. Aren't, the, aren't you guys all alike? And what I want to do with this question is set myself up as being different because a biocompatible biological dentist is different. What kind of dentist are you looking for? Puts a question in their mind saying, well, what are the differences? And that just allows you to think, are, are they looking for these things? They're either looking for health, they're looking for beauty, or they're looking for longevity. One of those three things is what this, this, this question is going to answer. And if they're looking for, for health or longevity, that's fine. If they're looking for beauty, that's fine. All of it's okay. But it narrows it down to, I know exactly what we're talking about here with this patient. Why are you in my office today? Now, the next question could come rather quickly right after that. And that could be um, almost immediately while you're gaining rapport. But I don't want you to ask this question unless you're in rapport with the patient. Don't ask this question right out of the chute. Gain a little bit rapport and have a, 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 a listening, I guess, to the, to the patient that you've, that you've been able to listen to their story just a little bit and kind of understand where they are. You need a little confidence with your, with your expertise and, and uh, with your listening for this patient. But at some point in time, very quickly, you understand why they're there. And then if they want, if they want veneers, if they want to be mercury free, if they just want their teeth cleaned, or if it's some other reason, uh, I want you to ask this question. And this is a, this is a verbal skill that's, that's designed this way. And you'd say, Mrs. Jones, after you've heard their story, and Mrs. Jones, you know, in our work together, what will your goals be? What do you want to accomplish? And let them answer that because they've never been asked that question either. And then they're going to tell you that they want to save their teeth, that they want all the mercury out. They might say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And you know where this patient's coming from. You might say, I want to keep my teeth for sure. And your responses to these kinds of uh, your response to these responses are going to play a large part in your treatment plan and your diagnosis. Somebody says, "I want to keep my teeth for sure." Then you then you need to put in your treatment plan. Well, let me show you the best way to reach your goals. Now, you want responses to these questions because what patients say to themselves is far more important than what other people say to them. So when they say, I want to keep my teeth, you, you, need, to, you need to respond to that because they're going to want to be consistent with what they just said to you. So your response might be, well, your best chance to save your teeth um, will be this treatment plan or that treatment plan. And so you confirm back to them what they want. You want to be consistent and with their commitment to save their teeth. If they want to get the mercury out or just get their teeth cleaned, your option would be to confirm and have them be consistent with their commitments on this. So I don't want you to change any of the words on that either. It says, in our work together, what will your goals be? What do you want to accomplish? And let them speak at that point in time. So the third question comes a little bit later in, in, in the new patient examination. And, and I want you to have av the availability of maybe your periodontal probings, maybe your bleeding indexes, maybe your how many, how many bridges, how many root canals, what have they got in their mouth? And obviously, many of these people are going to have mercury fillings. And many of them may have said, you know, I'm here because I'm going to get the mercury out of my mouth. Well, and then it's a pre-sold case. You don't have to go through many of these questions at all. But if they're not quite aware of the mercury in their mouth, 
then you would go through your exam and you'd uh, tell your clinical assistant that she's recording all of your records, uh, that there's uh, this bridge and this root canal and these fillings, and the patient would kind of understand um, uh, what they've got in their mouth already, and a verbal skill would be something like this. Mrs. Jones, there's been a lot of concerns uh, in recent years about uh, not eating fish with high mercury content, and a recent article in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease states that mercury is now recognized as one of the causal agents in the onset of Alzheimer's disease, and you've got seven mercury fillings, Mrs. Jones. Are you going to keep your mercury fillings? So state the facts. Tell them they've got mercury in their mouth, and are they going to keep their mercury fillings? And it just poses the question, somebody might say, well, uh, my sister-in-law in Dallas, I know, just got all hers out. I've been, I've been hearing about this. I've been thinking about this. Tell me more. That opens up the conversation. And at that point, you can answer the question, and this is another verbal skill that I tell all my patients. Mrs. Jones, all of my patients are using non-metal biocompatible fillings when they replace their mercury fillings. Now, all of these verbal skills that I'll tell you today, all of them are very intentional. All of them have a purpose. This one is, obviously, Mrs. Jones is, uh, you call the person by name. There's no other uh, <laughs> indelibly marked on their brains is, is their own name. It's the, it's the uh, uh, best name, that, uh, the best word that anybody ever hears when they, uh, when they listen for something. They listen for their name. So start out with their name. The next thing is all of my patients. Uh, that means that there's social proof that everybody is doing this. Uh, are using non-metal biocompatible fillings that tells them that there's something better on the market. They're biocompatible. And the last part is when they replace their mercury fillings. And it says that people are replacing their mercury fillings, whether they're broken or by, or by uh, choice. Uh, they're replacing their mercury fillings. So this simple verbal skill relates all of that to the patient. Mrs. Jones, all of my patients are using non-metal biocompatible fillings when they replace their mercury fillings. So it just leads them into more questions. Now, when it comes to old, those new patients, when it comes to old patients, in your hygiene department, there are patients that are already there. They already trust your best recommendations. You're going to see eight of them tomorrow in hygiene. And 30% of them are waiting and willing to hear about how biocompatible dentistry can impact their personal health. Now, that 30% number just didn't draw it out off the uh, off, out, out of the hat. Um, you anticipated my next question, Peter. Where did yeah. that number come from? <laughs> yeah, there are, there are studies that show that 30% of Americans are going green. There are studies that show 30% of Americans are recycling. And there's a study that shows 30-40% of Americans have pursued alternative health care possibilities already. Now, this is a third of your practice. Uh, this is a little bit, those, these numbers are too big to ignore, so to speak. So let me, let me break it. The one assumption that, just sorry, Peter, that people uh, obviously want to make is that their practice is representative of the United States population, and it probably is, you know. But uh, so I would, I would ask everyone to maybe avoid the snap conclusion that, well, but my patients are different. Uh, there may be subtle differences in the composition, but the chances are that uh, wherever you are, wherever you practice, that uh, your patient base is fairly representative of the population as a whole in, in this yeah. regard. I would have to, I'd have to agree. So um, it's, it's, it's a number too large to ignore, that's for sure. So let me Correct. just, let me put out some categories uh, for you that, uh, uh, that might make a little bit more sense because you can relate this to your own practice, and that, that is 10% of your current patients probably have no interest in hearing about how dentistry impacts their whole body health. Um, they, they don't have any problems with their mercury fillings and don't wish to have them addressed. So category C, I'm going to work from the bottom up with these two. Category C is probably about 30% of your patients show a vague interest in hearing about dentistry. They kind of understand that you're concerned, but they don't have any problems. So, uh, you know, hey, nice talking to you. Uh, that's kind of cool, but that's about it. Now. Category B gets more important. This is also probably 30% of your patients. These patients are on the verge of, of just about accepting your best recommendations most of the time. So within six months or a year, they will probably hear about 
mercury or BPA or uh, some family member in a distant city doing something about this. It will enter their life someplace. These patients need to be loved and cared for because they're going to gravitate towards your best recommendations. Now, category A is the 30% of the patients that are in your practice right now waiting and willing to hear about how biocompatible care is going to impact their health. This is a 30-year practice. Now, this is the key point right here. These patients need a new com a comprehensive exam right now. They've been in your practice for two years or 10 years or longer. You've learned an awful lot in the last 10 years, things they cannot benefit from because they are in hygiene now and it's getting really routine with the hygiene check and they don't know what you know. They can't benefit from your expertise. So these patients need a new comprehensive exam now. So you take them out of hygiene and put them into a new patient exam and you can start with the second takeaway right now, the seven diagnostic disciplines. These are the things that we need to look at when we create a treatment plan. So we diagnose it from these. Periodontal concerns, the restorative concerns with biocompatible materials, aesthetic orthodontic concerns, temporomandibular disorders, occlusal disease, sleep apnea, and other infections. Now, and Peter, is yeah. this by way of explaining to the patient why notwithstanding they've been a long time patient or they're involved in one procedure or another that, that the time is now for the comprehensive exam because that's still a choice and patients you know, being people being skeptical, patients being people too, they can be skeptical and they may view this as just an opportunity to sell them something they don't need. So obviously I would assume this is all of getting them to want this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, that's all in your verbal skills there. You can say with, with, with the current level of, of research that we have now, says you, I've not been able to, to, to treatment plan and diagnose you the way uh, if you'd have been entering, entering my practice today, uh, I would do things differently, so I want to afford you that same, uh, that same courtesy that I do with my new patients. And Excellent. L let, me have, let me bring you back for a complimentary, comprehensive exam and then start with your seven diagnostic disciplines. So, okay. uh, so your recommendation is that it be complementary, and I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Because this I is an opportunity to help enhance the care. Uh, especially for, especially for the 30% of the patients that are some of your biocompatible or some of your best patients, because they're going to buy into your best recommendations. So um, I think it would be complementary. So mm -hmm. here is a self-test. Now, this, this test um, uh, I developed just to rate yourself on diagnosing the oral systemic connection. On the left hand side, one through seven, those are the seven diagnostic disciplines. The next uh, line is the treatment planning range of fees that you might be able to expect from your treatment plan, which goes from um, zero to twenty thousand dollars for a complete restorative case in biocompatible uh, or a complete veneer case, but um, this is where you, you, you earn your money in your new patient diagnosis. Um, so if you, don't, if you don't diagnose and treatment plan your patient uh, straight away um, for, let's just say, $1,500, it's going to be real hard next year to, to, to add any diagnosis up, you know, up on and add on to that. So you make your money in your first diagnosis on your new patient exam. You collect it when you do the procedures, obviously, but you make your money on the new patient exam. This is just a test to see, do you have a system to diagnose this, and do you implement these diagnostic disciplines? Or do you diagnosis and yet you refer out? Or do you, you diagnosis and you don't implement or refer? Or the last column, you don't have any system at all to diagnose these. So it's an eye-opener when you take this test. Now, um, there, I've got this. You can go to the biocompatibledentist.com self-test. Go to that, uh, uh, that page, and you can download that test for yourself and just take it. It's kind of an eye-opener to find out where are you not serving your patients and where are you leaving money on the table as far as a business is concerned. So let's start with the periodontal concerns. I want to show you one of my old verbal skills. Now, it's a little bit uh, of embarrassing, but I'll go through it just the same. My old verbal skill would have been something like this about periodontal therapy acceptance, which is the hardest thing for some of the dentists that I, 
I talk to for them to get across to their patients. So I, my old, my old way of doing it would have been, well, Ms. Jones, I've looked over everything today. We found a couple of cavities, and there's a piece of tooth that's chipped up there on the top, and I can get those things fixed up good as new. And, and we found a little bleeding around the gums. So we'll get that taken care of with our hygienist. She'll have the gums looking great in no time. So that's a very easy thing to say, Mrs. Jones, this is, this is what we find. But at this point, I was minimizing the patient's conditions. And I know I always wanted to feel like, uh, I, I, you know, I got to be the good guy, I want to be well liked, don't want to upset too many people, want to be loved. Those things always passed through my mind until I decided that I wasn't going to um, I, I wasn't going to take on their disease, I guess. I wasn't going to, Correct well, behind the clock. <laughs> well, this is what I did. When, I guess when I did these things in a, in, in, a, in a few short sentences with this old verbal skill, I took away any immediacy of my care, and more importantly, I took away the opportunity for this patient to own and be responsible for her condition. And that's quite a disservice, I think. So now, not only that, I removed the burden of obligation from the patient and put it squarely on myself, my staff, my office. And now I'm responsible for her health. So I've got just a couple of small, easy things to do, not much of a concern to her because I've got it all under control. And I've been able to minimize the periodontal considerations. And this patient is uh, not solving her own gum disease. I'm solving it in no time at all, and I'm going to do it for an $86 profi fee. Uh, good job, Evans. You know that's the way I felt about it. You know, so I've minimized the patient's condition, taken on all the responsibility. I did not deserve this, so I can do better, and I know that you can too. So there, I changed. I there, I I now know that there's four ways. And I only like one of them, but there's four ways to solve the problem of periodontal acceptance. Now, the first way is to go ahead and sit down, explain to the patient, go over their insurance program, tell them all about their deductible, and uh, that the, the treatment is going to be $1,600 for their periodontal program. You wait six weeks for the predetermination to come back. You find out that the patient has talked to their husband, and he has second thoughts about this because he thinks she ought to go to his dentist. Or, or that they found out that the neighbor's dentist charges 86 bucks for cleanings. Now, who would have thought that the insurance company would know that if you delayed the decision to proceed with treatment four to six weeks, that 70% of the people don't ever follow through with your best recommendation? Your patient doesn't get uh, the proper treatment, and the insurance keep, uh, company keeps all the money. Now, who would have thought they would have ever figured out those statistics? You know? So that's why that happens. So the next way. You can tell the patient, you have gum disease. You're going to lose all your teeth, and if you don't fix this, you're, you're, you're going to lose all your teeth. You need to get it treated or get the hell out of my office. Now, I wish this would work for me more often because I feel like this, and I know you guys do too, is that some people are obstinate. They just don't see the connection, and we, it's like hitting a brick wall. Um, the third way is to tell the patient they have a disease, that is linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular events and strokes, and that you are taking all of the medical and the legal responsibility for their health. Um, that gets them um, at a point where they kind of understand this is a little bit more serious, but if you don't have a, a totally charismatic personality or you don't come over with a strong uh, position of authority, then the patient will still believe his own reality. And people believe, again, what they say to themselves much more than what other people say to them. And the patient's perception is that there's nothing that's bothering him, nothing hurts, there's nothing wrong here. What is he doing all this treatment for? So that's the best that we've got in most of our offices. Now the fourth way gives the patient the, the obvious way to, to go ahead with treatment for the periodontal therapies with no objections. Now I want to cover my new, my new verbal skills. So this is what um, this is what I tell my patients now. Not it, it's not word for word. I could break this down sentence by sentence to tell you the intentionality of of this verbal skill, but I'll read it for you right now, kind of like the way I'd tell it a patient. Um, Mrs. Jones, you have several teeth that need attention now. Now I, I don't want you to chew hard on your teeth until you get them fixed. 
Now, we also found a problem with your gums and the bone that concerned me. Now, you've got gum disease with bleeding gums, and with your level of gum disease, we have evidence that links the gum disease with an increased risk to heart attacks and strokes, so you can see why it concerns me. Now, not only that, but your bleeding gums are going to contaminate the, the bonding of your new fillings, so you cannot get your teeth fixed until your bleeding gums are under control. So you need to get your gum disease treated before you can fix your teeth. Now, I want you to get your gum treatment scheduled with Jennifer this week. Now, that takes some rehearsal and some practice. But inside of that is I have not taken any responsibility for Mrs. Jones' condition. As a matter of fact, in my, let me see if I can go back. No, I don't have to go back, I don't think. Let me go to the next slide because I'm going to tell you there is no place in this verbal skill where I am taking any responsibility. As a matter of fact, this is where I say, Mrs. Jones, you have a problem. Every single one of those places in the verbal skills, this is your bleeding gums, this is your level of gum disease, this is your teeth, you get them fixed. And the most powerful place in this verbal skill is going to be this. You cannot fix your teeth until your bleeding gums are under control. Now, Every patient knows that cavities get filled and broken teeth get fixed. And this is a patient that may have been, I, I could have set this up uh, with a patient that Mrs. Jones may have, uh, a broken uh, MODL mercury filling on tooth number 15, maybe some recurrent caries on tooth number 20 around a mercury filling, maybe even new caries on, on another tooth, and four to six millimeter generalized probing depths with bleeding. That patient and that patient wants to get things fixed or wants to get the mercury out, but they cannot get their teeth fixed until the bleeding gums are under control. So now you have uh, no objections to the number of appointments. You have no objections to the cost. You have no objections to the insurance questions, no objections to overcome when you use your verbal skills to, uh, to impress upon the patient that you cannot fix your teeth until your bleeding gums are under control. So you need to get your gum disease treated before you can fix your teeth. I want you to get your gum tre treatment scheduled with Jennifer this week. The call to action right after that. Don't leave it up to the patient to guess what's going to do. But after this verbal skill, I want you to be quiet. Shh, don't talk. Leave the room after this verbal skill. And leave it alone. No reason to be the good guy and no reason to be loved and take on the responsibility for Mrs. Jones's gum disease. So I think it's a really good point, too. Don't be afraid of silence folks. Uh, you know, we sometimes feel almost that the person's going to evaporate and vaporize if we stop, if we don't, if we, if we stop talking. It's the other person who then is, if anyone, is uncomfortable because they are, but the other thing is it just shows respect and the person really needs an opportunity to process what they've just heard. Yeah, so exactly. Silence is golden at this moment. That's a very important point that I just wanted to underscore. Yeah, I have to get out of the room because I keep talking. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk myself right out of the case. And Good I idea, you, then. I, I know you guys do, too. You'll keep on talking, yep. and you'll talk yourself right out of it. So you just have to leave the room and say, get this scheduled with Jennifer today. Uh, and then they know you mean business. Because this is, on this slide, it says the treatment of periodontal problems is not the mechanical model anymore. It's the medical model. The periodontal disease is the most prevalent chronic inflammatory disease that we know of. And it's, it's now recognized as a medical problem with a dental solution. So it's real easy to kind of jump on board and, and not scrape gums and, and scrape teeth, uh, but yet treat uh, a disease entity. We are learning, and this is, we're going through these seven diagnostic disciplines because of this right here. Physicians earn their living 90% of the time as being diagnosticians. They only earn 10% of their living by doing procedures. We, on the other hand, 100% by procedures. So we don't even think that diagnostic uh, uh, differentials are, are important enough. And um, yeah, hold on, let me go back to that. Yeah, oh, historically, diagnoses are, are, are low-paying jobs in dentistry. But when you do diagnose properly and you impart it to the, to the patient with the proper verbal skills, your case uh, level will uh, rise financially and your case acceptance will rise. So let me go into the, the second one. This is, this is the restorative concerns with biocompatible material. Now I'm going to cover the most important procedure you need to do 
in just a minute, but um, for those of you about biocompatibility uh, and dentistry, the kind of definition of biocompatible dentistry involves the relationship between the dental materials, treatments, procedures, and their positive or negative impact on whole body health. So I'll cover uh, the one procedure in just a minute, but let me go on to aesthetic and orthodontic concerns. Now, when we talk about whole body health and, and, and how we're supposed to serve our patients, aesthetics serves the emotional needs of our patients very well. And sometimes when I think of these seven diagnostic disciplines, I think of that, that physical, the emotional, the spiritual well-being of the patients that we serve, and this is one of them with, aesthet with aesthetics. We also, with aesthetics and, and, and uh, orthodontics, we also are talking about the biological, structural, and functional elements of our treatment also. And luckily, the biocompatible materials that we're coming up with right now are the most aesthetic too. So we've got the ceramics. Uh, Emacs, there's, an, there's a, a porcelain called Authentic that uh, I've found to be very biocompatible, and it's gorgeous. Not many labs use that. Zirconia crowns uh, are not quite as aesthetic as we need them quite yet. But I have to tell you, um, zirconia crowns are terribly biocompatible. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quickly becoming my favorite uh, crown to do. Uh, porcelains, on the other hand, right there, feldspathic porcelain has uh, aluminum silicates in it. And uh, there's going to be patients who are allergic to aluminum. Um, that question may not be on your health history right now, but you might want to add that. Just if somebody is allergic to aluminum, uh, there may be a low uh, subclinical problem with those aluminum silicates exposed in the oral cavity, and uh, it may be a concern to the patient. So composite resins have um, uh, direct composite resins, but indirect composite resin crowns and inlays and onlays. Uh, Diamond Crown and Teixeira are two that are very, very biocompatible. My favorite is Bell Glass. Uh, in my own hands, I've been able to work with that very, very well. And with implants, even we've got uh, we've been doing uh, zirconia implants for uh, months now in the office, and there's plenty of people who are uh, don't want metal in their bodies in their mouth. So we've got zirconia abutments on titanium, commercially pure titanium implants, and we've got totally zirconia implants and uh, abutments uh, available to us. So aesthetics are the emotional needs. Just uh, cosmetic contouring could do something. Uh, or just its uh, full mouth on the front to uh, um, improve the patient's emotional uh, appearance with their self-image about themselves. Now, TMD uh, issues, this is where it gets complicated. From here on down, these are the tough things for us to diagnose and take uh, our patients uh, to, into treatment on, th on these particular disciplines. Um, we don't really have a, a diagnostic protocol for this in our offices, uh, and that self-test will kind of help you understand where are you short, where are you coming up short on, on your diagnostic abilities here. The treatments for TMD can be easily conservative all the way through surgery. Um, luckily for us, I think most of the experts agree that you ought to start with conservative non-surgical therapies first. That means that it's, it's something that we ought to be able to learn quickly and implement um, in our practices. But it can add 500 to $5,000 worth of care in your office when you start diagnosing TMD disorders. Um, the um, treatment is always symptomatically, and I found it confusing. They've got biofeedback. We've got massage. We've got low-level laser therapy. These are things that were not in mainstream dentistry very long ago, just, just years ago. You never heard of these kinds of things in dentistry. Um, Trudenta is actually a company that's bringing it to the forefront in a big hurry. Uh, they have a system that treats migraines, which migraines hit 20% um, of our population. They're bringing therapies uh, in their protocols that involve massage therapy, low-level laser therapy, uh, things that were just unheard of before. So it's, it's, it, this is coming, and it's coming in a big way um, for the, the, what used to be called alternative uh, procedures and, and, and therapies. They're working their way into uh, dentistry real quick. 
um, occlusal disease. Now this is something that uh, can't be ignored. When you start working with non-metal uh, biocompatible dentistry, your, your dentistry is going to fail if you don't understand your uh, occlusal scheme. So uh, I think I think that it, it's warranted that we start learning about uh, the signs and symptoms of occlusal disease. So number one, we got pathological wear. We got fractures. You can classify them as severe and 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 moderate or incipient. Uh, you've got tooth sensitivity. Um, you've got hypermobility. You've got fremitus where um, a tooth, if you do this with, uh, and this is an eye-opener for the patients where they don't understand occlusal disease and they don't believe that they're damaging their teeth uh, as much as they are. But if you, with Fremitus, you can say, give me your finger, give me your pointer finger and put it on tooth number seven, eight, or nine or some tooth that's being traumatized and get them to feel the vibration of that tooth when they tap on their back teeth. They feel that the tooth is actually being punished and, and, and moving there. So that's a real obvious thing that a patient can now understand, oh my gosh, my bite is banging on these teeth so hard, I'm moving them in the socket. It's not good. Uh, number five is that fraction. Um, pretty obvious uh, to a patient because you can take photographs and just show them the tooth is just chipping away and you're cutting the tooth in half. Um, bone destruction. This is recession and bone destruction where uh, there is no periodontal disease. And the last one is um, pain or, or uh, tired muscles, uh, TMJ pain. Those are the signs and symptoms of occlusal disease. And th the sad part about it is that the weakest link is going to pay for this whole uh, unbalance of the occlusal system, muscles or, or wear or fractures. Um, there is an analogy that I use in the office to kind of car tires and uneven wear, and most of the guys will get this pretty much, is that everything's going to fail if there's not in balance. If your tires aren't in balance, you're going to be getting new tires sometime soon. Problem is, is that you get the first two set of teeth free, the, the third set costs. So they get that. And these are the things you see. Um, that picture on the lower right, this woman, is, she didn't have a clue that she ground her teeth. And I, I don't think you can look in the mirror and say, why did that ever happen? But it happened so slowly to her, she was unaware. Um, the, that picture on the top right, this is a, um, a patient of mine in Colonial Williamsburg here. He's a singer uh, that sings uh, on a lute in the old restored area in costume. But his mandibular anteriors are worn to the gum line there. And uh, he's not worried about it. <laughs> so uh, he's just going to be a dental cripple someday, and, and I can't stop it. So it's, this is this it is sure the most is, huh? this yeah <laughs> this is this is the one of the, this is the toughest thing I have to do is 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 try to show somebody the destruction the pathological destruction of the of the of the tissues. Yeah, we know about periodontal disease. Yeah, there's destruction of the tissues. Yeah, we know about cavities. There's destruction of the tissues. But occlusal disease is also a pathological destruction of the oral tissues. So now, sleep apnea is something else that we don't kind of get a good handle on. And uh, physicians don't either, for that matter. Um, but there are ways that we can, we can help it along. So um, we've got. Um, a sleep lab in, in, in the building that I practice in, there's a sleep lab just downstairs that uh, uh, is real handy to have when you want to treat people with sleep apnea because it goes undiagnosed because uh, there's no lab tests and no blood tests that you can do for this. So they don't do it unless you um, have a family history or sleep lab studies, it goes undiagnosed. And um, they don't even know it unless their bed partner notices their signs. And these are the signs and the uh, standards and the critical uh, 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 the standards and the criteria for sleep apnea concerns. Because with sleep apnea, um, it's a it's common enough disorder where you're pausing the breathing, it's shallow breaths while you're asleep, and it's only for a few seconds, but it can be up to a minute, and it can be five to thirty times an hour, and the uh, 
this gives you sleep and oxygen deprivation and poor sleep quality, things like that. So how do you diagnose this? Uh, it can be life-altering, life-threatening at times also. Uh, the oxygen loss, I think, at nighttime, it's going to trigger the brain to disturb the sleep, and then the drop in oxygen levels can reduce the quality uh, of, of the sleep. It triggers the release of stress hormones, can raise the heart rate, increase your blood pressure, get increased risk for heart attack, ar arrhythmias, stroke, things like that. So it's, a, it's like a chronic, it's a chronic ki kind of condition and requires management. It's just you can't cure this. It's a management thing. So how you detect it in our offices are six things here. The presence of turkey waddle. <laughs> and that always sounded funny to me, so I want to show you turkey waddle. Um, it's actually the cricomental space, and it's between the synthesis of the chin and the neck. It's, it's, you can see it in the turkey there. Uh, the second thing is that d d people have missing their posterior teeth, they got macroglossia. The next one is people have large tongues, I mean, sorry, large tonsils, uh, compared to the opening of the windpipe. And the fourth thing is that the pharyngeal tissues covers more than 25% of the base of the tongue. Fifth thing is that do they have an overbite? And the last thing, are they obese? So the good thing about this is that it makes it real easy to, de to de detect, uh, I think, 95% of these patients. And that is, if you take a look at these three things, you're going to have a positive predictive value of 95% for those people having uh, sleep apnea. So that can add anywhere from $500 to $5,000 to your treatment plan also. Now, the last of this is uh, other infections. These are things we might not think about to put into our treatment plan, but the mouth is actually um, the place where more trauma occurs than any other place on the body. The jaw bones get more infections than all other bones combined. Um, the alveolar bone turns over 10 times faster than any other bone. So we've got a lot of activity here in the mouth. Again, Danny, you asked early on said what I'd learned from these other people and these other clinicians is that the mouth is, is the most powerful place in the body. There's so much that happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else in the body, and this is one of them, infections. So periodontal problems. We've got osteonecrosis of the jaw, and we've got infected teeth. Now, this is a root canal. Uh, I'll, let me, I'll cover that in just a minute, I think. Let me tell you about the, about the infections. Periapical abscesses, periodontal abscesses, failing root canals, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. These are abscesses that, in some instances, not only just cause general ill health, but if an abscess extends into the floor of the mouth, it can threaten the airway. And I've had uh, a, a patient in the past couple of years uh, had to put in the hospital. It was life-threatening uh, because it went through the floor of the mouth. It didn't drain. So it's not something that uh, we want to take lightly. And let me, let me t tell you about root canal therapy from my point of view, from a biocompatible point of view, is that this is tooth number um, three. And the root canal is there. Now, this patient got into my office um, the night before, like last night. This tooth wasn't bothering him a bit. It was um, pain-free. He could chew on it. And I'll bet you now, if I asked everybody out there right now, raise your hands if you believe and understand that root canal therapy is successful when you can chew on it and it's pain-free. Uh, almost everybody would raise their hands, I am sure. But now... Eight hours later, after this tooth was pain-free, the night before, he shows up in my office, and we had to remove this tooth. Now, this was a successful tooth the night before. Eight hours before, it was successful. Uh, but you have to question that. You have to question it big, because this is what the tooth looked like when we extracted it. It's got uh, external resorption there on the mesobuccal root. It's got uh, granulomatous uh, material all over the place. This was successful-ish <laughs> yesterday. Um, depending on when you it, measured it. Depend, depending on when you see it. So just because uh, there's no pain, 
that doesn't mean there's no problem. Pain is a very poor indicator of problems when it comes to root canals. So not all root canals treated teeth that are pain-free and are functioning are successful. So I want you to take a PA of all your root canal teeth every single year uh, and diagnose it. And if you've got any cone beam tomography uh, available to you or in your office, it's going to open up uh, a, a fair amount of treatment for you when you start looking at patients that way also. So those are the seven diagnostic disciplines in dentistry. Now you might think of those I do my do my new patients that way also, but I want you to do it in hygiene new comprehensive uh, examination and a complimentary comprehensive examination for all of your hygiene patients. And here's the kicker. If you've got, I don't know, a thousand patients in your practice, active patients, maybe two thousand patients in your practice, and a third of them, thirty percent of them, are willing and waiting to hear about how biocompatible dentistry can impact their overall health, you've got hundreds of patients waiting for you, hundreds of new patients waiting for you on Monday morning. So I want you to take this into hygiene. And um, it's not what we want to talk about today. I've got, I've got resources about, uh, about how, to, how to take the practice from mercury safe to mercury free, I mean mercury free to mercury safe. But in hygiene, um, we've got a course that would help you and your hygienist start to talk about this and bring your, your hygiene check uh, around to being the most important part of the hygiene appointment. So you might want to uh, contact us about that. But that we're talking about whole body dentistry. Now, this is getting to the third takeaway I want to give you today. And that is this, that BPA, mercury, this, these are in the news. In the past 24 to 36 months, the scientific flashlight is, is focusing in on these things. Um, we have great science. We've got good reason. We've got good uh, research now that leads us into the future of whole body dentistry. And so this era of diagnostics in dentistry, this is where it's going for us to become more of the medical model rather than of the mechanistic model. And there's a lot of educational resources out there. Uh, we have a lot of them at thebiocompatibledentist.com. So in doing this, you're going to develop the most profitable business model in dentistry, and you're going to enjoy the most personal and professional satisfaction because you're not looking for something to fix all day long. You're there to help people. So the third takeaway. Take your mercury-free practice into being a mercury-safe practice. And I want to give you the number one procedure that uh, everyone needs to do to get this done. And that is the safe removal uh, and replacement of mercury fillings. Now, we've got a, a lot of mercury-free dentists out there, and they tell me, says, yeah, I haven't placed a mercury filling in, in like 10 years or 2 years or 50 years or whenever. And I said, well, that's wonderful. That's good. I applaud you for that. But you're going to be taking them out for the next 25 years on a daily basis. That gives us cause to concern because uh, we're, we're finding the science now that mercury fillings do release mercury vapors. Mercury fillings do the normal things uh, that we know mercury fillings do, like cracked teeth. But the procedure of removing mercury fillings with heating up the mercury fillings releases more mercury vapors, and I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, so there's a concern for the safety for you, your staff, your patient, and I'll show you about the environment. Um, so this is what we normally see with a mercury filling. Um, the mercury filling on the left is cracked, so okay, the patient uh, has got to replace this mercury filling. Uh, and what you find underneath it is mesial to distal, a crack through and through. So all this person had to do is come down on a piece of toast the wrong way and crack this tooth in half. Uh, if the mercury filling hadn't been cracked, uh, a regular dentist might not have bothered this tooth at all when this tooth was at, at, at a high level of risk. Um, this is, and I don't have, I won't run this video, but this is a tooth. And you can go to uh, IAOMT.org. You can also, I think I've got an, an, on another slide, you can go to YouTube, you can go to Smoking Teeth 
on YouTube, and you will see this short little minute video. And it's a, it's a mercury filling uh, in front of a phosphorescent plate uh, that shows the mercury vapors, because mercury vapors are uh, odorless, colorless. You can't see them. Um, and it shows the mercury vapors. They'll, they'll, they'll do things like rub a pencil on it, a pencil eraser, and just heat it up just a little bit, like you're polishing teeth with the profi paste. And all these mercury vapors are just flooding off of this tooth. So um, for the safety of the staff and you, there is, oh, there, I've, I've got, I've got, go to Smoking Teeth on YouTube and just Google up the Smoking Teeth and you'll find this, this uh, video. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, for the protection of you and your staff, there are better masks than our, than our particulate masks. The, the masks that, uh, you know, Benko and Patterson are going to sell us are, are, are fine for viruses and, and, and aerosol droplets, but mercury vapors are a different animal. This mask is the best that i found uh, because I don't want to have one of these great big canister masks that are designed specifically for those kind of vapors. This is a, a mask produced in the UK, uh, and I've been using it for a couple of years now, and, and, uh, and I, I think that this mask is what's going to uh, be the easiest for us to use. Um, and here, I'll show you this. This is my clinical assistant, Kelly. She's been with me for 12 years. Uh, she came to me when she was 19. She is my only clinical assistant. Um, and this is just how easy it is to get on with uh, the mercury mask. Um, she's been able to do over $100,000 worth of dentistry in, in months, all by her lonesome. Uh, didn't kill her, but she's uh, very productive on by a single, uh, a single assistant. And so she's ready to remove mercury that easily. So um, it's, not, it's not difficult to get the staff protected from mercury vapors. The patient I'll get to in just a minute, but this is the kind of thing that we'll see in some patients. You know, 80, 90, 100% mercury fillings with pins. You can make them mercury free. Those are uh, uh, bell glass crowns on the right. Um, but the six things we need to protect the patient are this. Protecting us, um, the doctor and the assistant, mercury vapor masks and just uh, remove your gloves after that and uh, it's about the best that we can do right now. For the patient, I want you to use a rubber dam. Uh, there's also high volume evacuation for the mercury vapors coming right off of that tooth. Now there is a product called the Swedish Cleanup uh, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, I want you to use a high speed hand piece uh, or if, you want, if you've got enough torque. You can use a slow speed hand piece because there's less heat created and uh, there's been evidence that uh, it's less microfracturing of the enamels uh, rods on the tooth structure so it just saves a, a better tooth when you're done. Um, you want to have a sterile water supply and lots of it to keep it cool. cool. You want to have a source of oxygen available for the patient so you can flood the, the patient with oxygen instead of mercury vapors and you want to install a mercury retrieval system. Now. This mercury retrieval system is part of um, what is not required by the most of the states in the country. I think there's only 14 states in the country. My, my state, uh, it actually it's the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, doesn't require us to have a mercury retrieval system and uh, do it voluntarily. So the EPA is starting to get in on the act on this uh, because of the, uh, uh, the bioaccumulation of mercury in, in the environment, not only locally, for you, because I wanted to do something extra to prevent the mercury from, from going into the environment uh, through my office, but there is a global treaty now this year signed to uh, kind of control the global accumulation of mercury, and uh, because it's an element, you can't break it down into something less toxic. You can only contain mercury. So that's part of what we want to look at in the dental office from our point of view um, and through a mercury retrieval system. So the Swedish cleanup looks like this. It's, it's, it's just like a high volume evacuation tube, but it's, it's bigger for a handle, and it's got a disposable tip on, on the end of it that surrounds the tooth you're, you're working on. You could use a rubber dam, you could get your quadrant work done, uh, but this does one tooth at a time, um, and it sucks off immediately. The, ver the mercury vapors off to one side and most of the particulate matter. So I like this a lot. Uh, very easy to use. It's out of the way. It gives you access to the tooth, and uh, it's just a breeze to use. 
uh, if, if a rubber dam, if, it, if you're working on tooth number two or one way back there and you can't get a rubber dam around it, uh, the mercury, uh, the, I mean the Swedish cleanup is a great, um, is a great little instrument to have. So that's what that looks like. And the IAOMT.org, they sell this uh, particular apparatus. Um, and again, those are the vapors that you can see a little bit coming off that off to the left, like over at 10 or 11 o'clock. Those are the vapors that come off every amalgam when it's heated. And you could do that when you're chewing or when the teeth are polished or when you have hot coffee. It doesn't take much to get the vapors coming off that. And smoking teeth is the place to go to on YouTube. Now, the mercury retrieval system, I use the Liberty Boss. This is the one. It's very small. I've got four operatories in my office. Uh, this is a three-year capacity. Uh, it's just a few hundred dollars, like five, six, seven hundred dollars. Uh, it's 99 point something percent effective. It's totally hands-free. Uh, it's a great little uh, mercury retrieval system, simple to install, uh, and it's hands-free when, when they uh, give you a new one. So it's wonderful. Because um, when handling the mercury, you know, we are the only unregulated industry when it comes to mercury. Everybody else has got um, regulations on how much mercury vapors can go per cubic meter. And our staff is exposed to these amounts of mercury vapors, and the state and the, and the federal agencies have their limits when it comes to mercury vapor exposure. Everybody except uh, dentists. So biocompatible materials. Here's one person that came into my office wanted the metal and the mercury out of her mouth, and so um, that's what biocompatible dentistry looks like. Uh, these happen to be all be bell glass. If it was zirconia, uh, it wouldn't be so uh, radiolucent. It would be more radio-opaque for sure. Uh, but that, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, probably a $30,000 case right there. So it's a good case to have to come in, in the office now and then. And here, here's your biocompatible quadrant care again. And that's just what um, is possible when you deal with getting the mercury out of somebody's uh, body. Now, the biocompatible patient, these are people who want to be healthy. So they all, they, 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 they're already tied into being healthy when, when they're in your practice. And I'm thinking 30% of your practice are people that are thinking about this. They're gluten sensitive. They may have um, chronic fatigue syndrome. They may be immunosuppressed. They may just have read about it and want something better for their young family. This is not just a bunch of old people or, or, or uh, wacky people that want to be healthy. These are everyday people, uh, teachers that are teaching your kids, policemen, everyday people. Uh, they're talking about getting the mercury and the metal free. So. I want you to present how to solve the patient's problem. I want you to present it emotionally. That's going to be difficult because normally we, we present it as mechanically. We, we tell them how we're going to fix their teeth, right? And we, we need to talk about the emotions because they are already tied to the benefits emotionally of their health. So you get, that's where your case acceptance goes up skyrocketing because you already got a patient who wants to understand emotionally how it's going to help their perceived uh, benefits to their health. So those are the three takeaways that I wanted to impart today. Uh, it's how to solve your new patient problem, especially in hygiene. Get them back in for a complementary, comprehensive care, create a new patient now that you have something to go with, something to bite into, some kind of uh, more energy and, and, and influence with your uh, Rediagnosis and a comprehensive uh, new exam with those seven diagnostic disciplines. You can become a better diagnostician and your treatment plan uh, is going to be accepted much more readily because these are patients coming out of hygiene that already trust your best recommendations. And the third takeaway was your mercury filling, um, I mean, sorry, your mercury free office to become a mercury safe office and how that's going to benefit the patients, the practice, and the planet. Um, I'm going to get to that list of BPA-free composite resins in just a minute, but I want to tell you, for so, those of you who, who want to connect and go deeper with more resources, just go to the biocompatibledentist.com quickcourse.html, and on there we've got a course that is a, uh, what we call the Natural Path to Dental Profits quick course. Um, we don't 
call it the natural path to dental production. Uh, production is, is pretty easy to do. We're more interested in, in, in how profitable you are rather than how much production you do. Uh, people that have a million dollar practice are still broke, and uh, that's a fact. But on the quick course, there's audio and full transcripts. The verbal skills are in this to address your patient's concerns and questions, and you're going to need uh, to practice your verbal skills. Some people say, you know, where do I start? I don't know what to say to my patients. I don't, you know, what do I do? Those questions I get a lot. Well, in this course, you, verbal skills are there. There's a complete history on BPA and mercury and materials. Uh, it's just uh, amazing of, of what's happened uh, in the history of mercury and BPA. And those are the facts that you can put into your verbal skills uh, as you talk to patients. There's the procedures, the protocols to provide the mercury safe care uh, with checklists. And there is a bonus that I want to give everybody on the call right now. Um, that is this. I'm going to add a consulting certificate for 15 minutes of conversation with me so we can answer all of your questions and get the implementation into your office. Now, that's at the biocompatibledentist.com quick course HTML. This course sells online all day for $294. Uh, I want to sell it when Danny and I talked. I want to sell it for $77 until tomorrow night at midnight. Um, that's a 75% discount. So I want you to, I want you to get that. Um, now, let me tell you just in, a, in the last bit of my promise, uh, I want to tell you about composite resins. Uh, bisphenol A, BPA, um, is a chemical that's a hormone disrupting chemical. It's kind of thought to be uh, bad for uh, children and uh, infants. Companies that produce uh, plastics are using BPA to do it, and it's been going on since the 50s. Um, there are numerous old studies of it being safe, but now there are some people that have some concern. The National Toxicology Program at the Department of Human Health and Human Resources, uh, they have some concern. Walmart just recently um, quietly removed all of the baby can foods with plastic liners in it with BPA. They removed it from the shelves. So. Recent research also shows that this, this GMA composite res resins produce low-level behavior changes in kids. So we're, we're learning more and more about the materials that we're placing in the most powerful place on the body. So these are the composite resins that are BPA-free. DRM research has a product called Diamond Light and Diamond Flow. I like these products. Um, they are they sh oh, they polish up. Uh, they look fabulous. The, this this is a good company. It's a small company that is just dedicated to biocompatible materials. Uh, nothing else. Parkell. They've got plenty of other composite resins, but they also produce this Parkell TMPT. Um, they've got it in lots of different shades, but it's trimethylpropylol trimethacrylate. It's a whole different. Uh, chemistry than uh, this GMA. And I've used this. I like this product in my hands, too. Uh, Horaeus Culzer, they've got two products, Venus Diamond and Venus Pearl. It's a urethane monomer, and uh, it's not this GMA. Now, I have not used this product in my office. I don't know how well it works in my hands. Um, but it's, it's a BPA-free, obviously, composite resin. Uh, Bisco. Very small company, well, not as small as it used to be. It's, it's growing rapidly. But Bisco has Elite Fill and Elite Flow. I've used these products for a, a, a long time, and I've talked to the technical people at Bisco, and they assure me that it is BPA-free. Uh, so those are, the, those are the materials that I use and that I know of that are BPA-free um, uh, for your offices to use when you get those kind of questions. And for those of you who want to go deeper on this subject, go ahead and um, order this online uh, $77 course. It's going to give you the verbal skills. It's going to give you the history to, to, uh, to have the facts behind what you're talking about. It's going to give you the procedures to be all mercury safe in your office. And there's a consulting certificate to get with me on any questions you've got about myocompatible uh, care and how it impacts your practice. This, is, this ought to be, I think that dentists ought to be profitable doing this. So, um, Danny, I'll pass it back to you and we can answer a question or two. Um, and uh, 
uh, get specific about uh, some people's concerns. Let's go ahead and do that. And before we do get to it, I just want to, uh, first of all, Peter, thank you for even sweetening the offers more than uh, we had discussed. I think the 15-minute consultation is, is a wonderful and, and, and greatly appreciated addition. And I just want to acknowledge you. You know, we've been doing practice perfection for about a year and a half, so we've done about 18 or so of these. And we've had a lot of top-flight thought leaders and influencers they tend to specialize on sort of one part of the brain, if you will, or as we like to talk about, one of the three C's of mastery of the oral systemic practice, one of those, you know, those three being clinical, collaborative, and communication. Yeah. What you've done, I think, to a greater extent than anyone, and I want to acknowledge and thank you for that, is that with all the technical and clinical training and clear knowledge you have about how to deliver these procedures, what you've also done, and we talked a little bit about this before we went online, is the importance of simplifying and understanding the patient's perspective and how to communicate with them in such a way that you connect with them emotionally, you establish rapport, and really gain permission to allow them to, excuse me, elaborate on what's important and valuable to them by asking questions in the right way at the right time. And that this is, I think, you've done better than anyone to date, uh, given us the the panoply of the three C's. And so, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I, I think anyone that wants to practice, I think, quickly, uh, really would uh, do themselves a service by by staying connected with you. I like, in fact, the fact that you you are talking about the 30 percent of the patients who already get this to a large extent. Really, is a, I think, a quintessential practice in going after the low-hanging fruit, which is the way to gain and build confidence. These people already are willing to have a conversation with you. It's really simply a matter of relating what you do to what they already value. Doesn't exactly. It? Yeah. It, and it, then it's the perfect starting place. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is that if your communications are in place and while you're honing your craft, your communication skills with these people that are more uh, amenable to hearing your message, you're going to improve your communication with other patients who are going to be sort of uh, enrolling or evolving or sort of passing through their various psychological processes of, of first of all, creating awareness and then establishing credibility and trust and getting to a point where they raise their hand. So this is really a, you know, a fantastic foot in the door for any practice that just wants to really do, do well by doing good. And that's the tagline we use around here a lot. Well, so. yeah, I think it's time for a new advantage, you know, and, and so it, it, it may be in the connections of the people that trust you. That's one thing with your pet. It may be in your expertise, but, you know, most of all, I'm betting it's your attitude. You know, you, you need to outpace your competitors, and this is a very simple way to do it. Absolutely. That's right. And it really boils down to asking questions and, and asking them questions that they've never been asked before. That alone will di differentiate you. Yeah. Being different is better than being first or second. I mean, you know, that's a, <laughs> well, that's good. But, well, there's an exclusivity about about this. Um, and once you kind of get and role play it just a little bit, and that's again for a conversation with me, once you get that far, um, you're, it, it'd be well worth your time and investment uh, on, uh, on taking on um, this, you know, all I want is in life is an unfair advantage. You've heard that. This is that <laughs> unfair advantage. <laughs> Which is well earned, you know, and that's the thing too. Well, I like, you, you told the story you, where you began with verbiage that is maybe more commonly used still today by many practitioners, and we understand where it comes from, but it, it doesn't work. It doesn't serve a purpose for you or the patient. It, it really, you want responsibility for the patient's care or, for, you know, you don't want to take ownership of everything because that's, that's what they want, and it may... You know, like you said, make you feel that for an $86 pro fee or you, you pat yourself on the back or whatever the exam uh, was, you wind up really abdicating responsibility in an indirect way. And, well, that's and why, that you, Danny, the 30% of the practice that you've got in your practice right now, the 30% of your patients who are buying into their health, and that's what, that's what you want to pay, the, the operative word is buy at that point. You've got them in your practice already. They're buying into their health. You just have to find the 30%, and you do that through questions. That's right. And speaking of questions, let's go ahead and get to some questions. First we have, let me get back to the list here. 
Adam, who asks, you mentioned the seven diagnostic disciplines. Uh, he wants to know how to get his hygienist on board with co-diagnosing whole body oh, health. Okay. Uh, that's very simple. Um, we've got a product called, um, uh, it's called uh, the critical importance of hygiene reporting in practice growth and prosperity. So everybody write that down. No. <laughs> but it's how to get, in, in essence, it's how to get the most out of your most powerful resource in the office, and that's your hygienist. So that is a four, it's a four CD course uh, that brings your hygienist into the role because she is the most powerful uh, positive resource you've got in your practice. Do not let that lay fallow. Going into this hygiene check is like, uh, 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 oh my God, it's going to bother me. You know, my hygienist needs me again. So it's another three or four or five minutes away from my terribly important filling or crown that I'm doing. And uh, it seems like, okay, I'll just check it. Fine, you're doing fine. See you next time. How are the kids? Did you go hunting? I'll see you later. When you have your hygienist on board with this, it is, it is, it is very much of a dance. Your hygienist will be able to report to you in five and a half minutes everything about those seven diagnostic disciplines. In this course, we've got checklist after check. I gave you a couple, actually, in the, on the webinar today. Those standards of criteria of sleep apnea was one of them, of occlusal disease. Those are some, just some of the checklists that we have. We've got 18 things that need to be addressed for perio, 27 things that need to be addressed for operative and, and restorative with biocompatible materials. This is the course that will take your hygienist and you so that you have a little bit more respect for each other and it's kind of like a dance when you get in there. You, you, you want to go back and forth, back and forth, don't step on your toes, you know, have some fun. Uh, and you don't know where you're going to end up in the dance. You know, it's just a dance. And uh, but uh, but you know what's coming. She but knows it's a what rehearsed you want. dance too, isn't it, Peter? Say it again. I I didn't it's a rehearsed dance. Yeah, it's very much of a rehearsed dance. You know the protocol. You know what you're doing in there. It's, it's you don't leave it to happenstance. And so the course is um, available uh, online, um, and it's a great course. It is a great course. You need to get it. Yeah, I'm sure that it is. Uh, Missy asks uh, if you offer detox to your patients. We do. We've got um, we've got uh, a universal detox program because a lot of the patients are already seeing uh, a physician or a naturopath or a, 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 an herbalist or a, a doctor of osteopathy. So they're, they're, they're seeing people who already have them on a detox program. Uh, we tend not to interfere with that program. Then uh, we don't insist that they they do things our way on that. But yeah, there's universal ways to detox. Uh, you can you can sit in a sauna and sweat uh, toxins out, uh, and you can you know just vitamin C and and uh, chlorella and a couple of other things, very simple things to do to detox, all the way to IV chelation. So uh, it, it spans quite a bit, uh, and we rely on on the other health professionals to help us out with that detox. Very good. Uh, Ted wants to know about I think. Uh, advertising regulations. I and mean, he asks, are you allowed to advertise? I know the answer to that is yes, or else we wouldn't be in business. But I guess he also wants to know to what extent this might vary by state. Uh, probably uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, I can tell you that, that, that the board, uh, and, and this is with all, you can't set yourself up as different uh, in advertising from other, other dentists. Everybody's supposed to be the same. You know, all dentists are just alike, just alike, just alike, just alike. It's uh, it's against the bylaws for you to say you are better than someone else. I don't think you can use the word quality in most states. It, yeah, maybe not. So, uh, so as long as you are, the board of dentistry, uh, in most states, they don't want to they don't want to touch this subject anymore. Ten, twenty years ago, the ADA was upset about all of this. Now. The ADA is backing off a little bit, saying that the, the, the issue is, is, is definitely between the patient and the doctor. That's where it should be. That's why those verbal skills I gave you are so important so you get clear on how your patient wants to be treated in your office. But the only time this is going to interfere is that if, if another dentist in your community complains about you, and then the board is going to have to at least investigate a little bit. But that is so rare these days. Um, I will say it's increasingly rare, and you know, from where we sit, and we've been doing marketing for practices since 1989, 
that that incident, I cannot recall the last time that we were asked to pull, for instance, a direct mail piece because of yeah. some complaint. And it always emanated from some fellow practitioner in the area who, just to put it kindly, had a different philosophy of communicating with prospective so, patients. Uh, to answer that, so I would not be I would not be overt and say, "Hey, get all your mercury out. You're going your Parkinson's is going to go away. Your Alzheimer's is going to go away." You cannot do that. Uh, you, 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 but you, if you want to be dentistry, can impact whole body health? Absolutely, it can. And uh, the ADA understands that right now. So um, I wouldn't have any fear in just differentiating yourself a little bit, saying you practice mercury safe dentistry. And I would I would uh, agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. And then uh, I think we've got time for one more question. I guess Leo wanted you to elaborate on the materials that you use for composite resins. Uh, composite resins, there are there are people that, that you'll see in your practice um, and people that I definitely see in my practice that unless you ask the right questions, you, you won't know whether they're immunocompromised. If that's not a question on your health history, if you don't have the questions, have you ever been tested for an allergy to mercury? You know, is that who whoever puts that on their health questionnaire? Uh, I now put it on mine because I want them thinking about it. No, I've never, but you know, one to two percent, maybe three uh, percent, I've heard that of, of of the population is allergic to mercury. You can also put a question in there: Are you immunosuppressed, or are you, are you taking immunosuppressants? Because all these people, if their if their bodies are are struggling to be healthy, you won't know about it because if we're thinking this is a tooth and gum business, you won't be asking about your whole body health. But these people don't need any more inflammatory burden or any unnecessary free radicals coming from mercury or whatever. They don't have enough uh, any immune system to spare. Uh, what we can do is clean up the mouth and allow their immune system to work better for their own health. So the composite resins are you know, it's just as much important that we that we look at the composite resins because we're putting foreign objects in the most powerful place in the body, and you want to make sure that it's in balance with the body. And there are ways to test for the biocompatibility of the materials that you use. So um, you can test it actually three different ways: uh, muscle testing, uh, applied kinesiology. You can take a blood serum sample test and send it off to special labs that will test it, uh, test all these materials for uh, biocompatibility. Or you can go a very specialized way. It's a cutting edge way They're called computerized electrodermal screening uh, that will tell you if a material is, is, is in harmony with uh, a person's body. So when in question, you can do that. But the other, the ones I gave you from uh, Diamond Light and Bisco and uh, Parkell, those have tested well year after year after year for me. So those are good products. Those are the default ones. And you can, can imagine, Danny, there are, there are, there's like, it's like Major League Baseball players. Yeah, there's some, there's some really good ones and there's some not so really good ones. Same with, same with composites. You may have a composite that's not such a good composite. There are, uh, just because it's white doesn't mean it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Sounds too, though, like you're saying that one size does not necessarily fit all and that it might make sense to uh, uh, have these protocols for, for testing the individual and getting results to, which might indicate other than because they may not even know if they're immunocompromised, for instance, or may have developed that. So uh, are you suggesting that, that, that practices acquire these, these diagnostic tools or at least one of them to then know with more certainty which, which materials to use with which patients? Absolutely. When a patient comes in and you and you do understand that they are a sick person with dental cares, now we know that that we're we're, we're treating more whole body dentistry. Definitely, you want to understand that what you're putting in the body is less toxic than what you're taking out. Very good. Well, on that note, Peter, I really again want to thank you for the uh, informative, educational, and and really most of all actionable skill set that you've just shared that the dentist and team can immediately use to help grow their practice, not today, then tomorrow. So thank My you pleasure. Again. My pleasure. Now, owing to our involvement with the AOSH annual session, as well as the Climb for a Cause annual event and some other commitments, 
Practice perfection takes a break this September. We want you to please mark your calendars, therefore, for Thursday, October 10th at noon central time when our special guest, all the way from South Africa, will be Dr. Julian Holmes, who will speak on ozone therapy's promise to save lives, not just teeth. In the meantime, this is Danny Bobro, as always, thanking you for your commitment to practice perfection. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>